Hello, my name is Vic Fearing and uh, I work for EDB and this is a talk about the features of SQL in PostgreSQL compared to the features in SQL in the standard SQL. It's going to be abridged because uh, if I talked about everything that was different, we'd be here for another couple weeks. Um, so this is just um, some samples of, of things that I find important. So first of all, what is the, um, the SQL standard? Peter just talked about this. So anybody who was in Peter's talk already knows. But it's basically a, a collection of people who come from various uh, co um, companies and vendors and get together and standardize the language. Uh, but like most people know, anything that is done by committee is not necessarily the best design thing. Um, <clears throat> for example, a camel is a horse designed by committee. Uh, and so you have little pieces of things here and there that don't quite fit together or syntaxes that should be harmonized but aren't. Um, and I'll, I'll have more to say about this later because since I started giving this talk, things have changed in my life. Um, but for now, this is, this is how I think most people think of what the, the standard is. And so I, I left the talk as is. <clears throat> so one question um, that I like to ask is, is this valid standard SQL? No. Create index on tap. Who says no? One, two, three. Who says yes? Who says who cares? OK, who says who cares? Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the answer is yes. That is valid standard SQL. Okay? Even though I've always thought that the SQL standard doesn't talk about indexes at all at because all. that is a performance um, consideration and performance is an implementation issue. But there is this grammar here which says that a directly executable, ex executable, blah, directly executable statement is some of all these things and then an implementation defined statement. So what's that? Well, we have to see the syntax rules. So we don't really know what that is. And the syntax rules say it's implementation defined. So create index is valid standard SQL. Create publication, all these things, vacuum is standard SQL because of this little thing that says, well, whatever you want to be standard SQL is standard SQL. Question? Use the mic. By that mi mi reasoning. Microphone. Uh, microphone, microphone, please. Uh, so, yep. Yep. all right. Uh, Is there a button to push? It's on. Okay. So, but test. Okay. So, by that reasoning, what isn't a part of the SQL standard? Nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. The, the, whatever you want, whatever command that you would like to. This candy wrapper is valid SQL. Uh, well, no. The, the but, words on it. Sure. Okay. Yeah, the words on it is valid, valid standard test. Thank you. Yeah. So that's fun. But despite these inconsistencies and everything, yes, a question. So when did that catch all end I probably from the very beginning, but I, I don't know. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, I don't even know why it's there because it just means that any syntax, I mean, uh, a Python program is valid SQL. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, despite that, I really love the SQL standard. Uh, when, when, I, when I first started reading it, it uh, took me a while to get into the, the, the language that it uses to understand what, what's happening. But there are some really beautiful ideas in there uh, and concepts that I had never seen before, um, mainly because Postgres doesn't, doesn't support them. <clears throat> How is this pronounced? I heard somebody say SQL, and I, I myself say SQL. Which is correct? Is there a correct one? Well, as of very soon, yes, there is a correct one, and the correct one is SQL. 
and this is one of the documents that will be coming out in the next, uh, it is in the next version, right? Uh, part 10? Yeah, it says the name SQL in the context of the standard is not an acronym and is properly pronounced SQL. So all the people who say SQL, you're wrong. Um, and now we, we have, it's official. So it's not just a debate anymore. Um, and then it says a whole bunch of stuff that I'm not gonna read out loud, but uh, some products that implement the standard pronounce it other ways, but yeah, yeah. But uh, it was supposed to be SQL, but that was trademarked, so it's SQL now. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna start off with some things that the standard, I think, that the standard gets wrong. Uh, things that if I had been on the standard committee originally, I would not at all have allowed to, 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 to stand. Uh, the first one is trigger execution order. In Postgres, what is the order of execution of, tri of, of trigger? If you have multiple triggers on a table, in what order are, are they? Alphabetical. Alphabetical. In Oracle, does anybody know the order of tr triggers? You give it uh, an order. You say, I want this one before that one, or this one after that one. I don't know what uh, other systems might do. The standard says the order of execution of a set of triggers is sending by value the timestamp of creation, which is just terrible. That means if you want to change the order of your triggers, you have to drop them all and recreate them all. That, that could be fixed, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Yes? Has anyone implemented that? Um, not to my knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, the next one is timestamp with time zone. Um, the one that we know from Postgres, I believe, is quite useful. The one um, from the standard, I don't even know how it works because it says the time zone displacement, which means that there's an offset to it, and the time zone is not an offset because it changes twice a year in some places, uh, is constant throughout the time zone, changing at the beginning and end of summertime where applicable. So does that mean on daylight savings change, we have to update all our data, or what, what does this mean? Uh, I don't know. It changes. I think that's not very useful. And because this data type is not very useful because it, it deals in offsets and not in um, time zones, a lot of the interval and other arithmetic are also fairly useless in, in my reading of the standard. Whereas Postgres gets this, uh, I don't know if it gets it right, but it gets it done very well. And then there are inconsistencies that I talked about that are just kind of, why? Everybody knows this, right? Count star. What does the star mean? Yeah, it does not mean all of the columns the same way select star does. It means not very pretty to have just empty parentheses. And so let's put something in there when we don't have any arguments to put it, right? So yeah, but then why don't we have this. <laughs> this is not the way the standard defines row number or, or any other function that doesn't take any arguments. There, we just have empty parentheses, but it should be with a star, or the count should be without a star. Uh, Postgres actually accepts this, so you, you can do this in Postgres if you, if you want, but it, then you would not be writing standard SQL. All right, now some things that Postgres gets wrong. Create schema, and this isn't necessarily something that Postgres gets wrong, it's just something that Postgres is incomplete with. Um, do you know that when you create a schema, within the same statement of create schema, you can create a whole bunch of other things. You can, you can do create table, and, and create view, and create index, within one command. Most people will do create schema, and then create table, and then create table, but you can just do one, make my schema. And um, I had a, a question at a, at a different time that I gave this talk about, is that because um, the people who defined this didn't know how to do transactional DTL, and so this is only one command and it, the whole thing can be rolled back? I don't know the answer to that, but you can do this. But it is, it is incomplete in Postgres. Sir? Yes? Our 
tables as well as part of the package. So you can create tables and views with permissions in one go. Yeah, but if, if, if they have, okay, so, so he said that in Sybase, is that, was that what you yeah. said? So you don't end up with uh, tables and views that are uh, unprotected, basically. Yeah. Right, but if it's if you do all this inside a transaction, then you can fix everything you want before anybody sees it. In the old days, you can do that. Right, and and so that that may be why the, this is um, uh, why this syntax exists. I haven't really seen anybody who uses it, but it, it's there. But how is it incomplete? Well. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that we can put in it in, in standard SQL. Uh, and Postgres, we can do tables also and views, but we can't create a domain in, in a create schema statement. Can't create a domain, you can't create character sets, you can't create collations, you can't create transliterations, and I had to look up what that was. Um, you can't create assertions, but we don't have any anyway. We can create triggers inside a, a, a single create schema uh, statement can't create types, can't create casts, can't create orderings, I had to look up what that was too, uh, can't create transforms or routines, we can create sequences, we can do grants uh, in Postgres, the way Sybase and uh, SQL Server can do it. Uh, we can't do roles, because roles in Postgres are not schema specific, they're insta uh, yeah, instance specific. And then of course the standard doesn't say anything about indexes, but we can do that and they can't. Um, so some of that would be nice just for completeness to, to add to, to PostgreSQL. Um, again, nobody really uses it, so it's kind of a useless feature. It, it is really, uh, look, we can do everything the standard says we can do. But I would like that to be expanded a little bit better. The any aggregate. <clears throat> Any aggregate looks like this in standard SQL. So you select something from T, group by something, having any, and then some kind of condition that will apply to all of the rows in the group and determine whether the group itself is emitted or not. Um, that's nice. You can also say every if, if you wanted to say, like if, if you wanted to, all the groups where uh, the column is at most 42, inferior 42, then you can say having every column. But there's the any, it's like I want one of them to be below 42, and then I, I want that group, otherwise I don't. Well, we can't do that in, in Postgres. We have the every, but we cannot do any. So we have to do something ugly, like having bool or. Um, <clears throat> bool or, to me, is a terrible name. I mean, it, it is descriptive, we know what it does, but any is much nicer. So why can't we have this aggregate any? We can't have it because we decided to extend the standard uh, in a way that makes it impossible. As far as, I'm, as far as I'm aware, it's impossible to do it. And it's this syntax here. This is, I forget what the, the, the term is called, but this any here takes a subquery, and only a subquery, in, um, in the standard. But Postgres allows us to, to have an array there. And because of that, the grammar is, is ambiguous of whether we're trying to do uh, uh, the any array or if we're using the, the aggregate. And so we don't have the aggregate. It's unfortunate, but I use this thing all the time, and so I'd rather keep that and use bool or than, than the, the other. But <clears throat> that's something that Postgres cannot, without breaking a whole bunch of code, cannot align itself with the standard. Uh, there are case expressions. So Postgres can do um, this one. The, th these are both uh, valid in standard SQL and, and Postgres SQL. Uh, does everybody understand this, what, what the case statement is? Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of a shortcut. I think it, they call it the simple uh, case, where you say case and then the expression, which could be some long calculated thing, and then when one value, then do something, when other value, then do something, otherwise do something else. But that means, that's all equality. So if the expression equals x or when the expression equals y. 
and that's all we can do. If we want more than that, and here I'm using uh, some strange Postgres operators that are not at all standard, but um, if we want more than that, then we have to repeat the expression each time and use the full, the full syntax. So when expression overlaps with x, or when expression uh, abuts s, uh, y, or when the expression is null. If we want this type of thing and not just equals, we have to spell it all out. In the standard, the, the expanded case statement is like this, so where it's just the case expression and then you start with the operators. <clears throat> and, it, and it's a much simplified uh, syntax. And I'm not sure if, if there's a, a problem that's blocking us from implementing this or not, but I would really like to have this. It, it, it makes the, the query more readable in my view, and it also does not repeat the expression every time. And so if the expression is volatile, then... My understanding is the previous slide is that expression and that Postgres on the right, that expression is the different for every row, everywhere, Right. Okay. Right. So, so, so the question for 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 the recordings that don't have the microphone, uh, the expression on each one of these lines could be a different expression. I could have written expression one, expression two, expression three. Uh, and so, if in th this version, if I'm removing that, how how does that work? And well, the answer is right here. In in this one, it's just case and immediately when. So it's case when, and then you need full expressions. And this one is case expression, and then when okay. partial uh, expressions. Okay. Um, so I don't know how possible this is, but I would really like to have this in, in Postgres. Drop domain cascade is one of my, my favorites in the sense that I hate it. Um, who knows what a domain is? Or who doesn't know what a domain is? Okay. A domain is, to put it simply, a type with a constraint. It's a little bit more than that, but you, you can just say it's a type with a, with a, a check constraint. Um, so if there's something that I want in several columns uh, of different tables, and I want the same check constraint on that type, I just create a domain, and then I use, use the domain as the type for these things, and the constraint follows it all the way around. And if I change the constraint because I've, my logic was faulty or something, I, I, I go and change the domain to change the constraint, the other columns all automatically inherit that change. So very useful feature, unless you want to drop it. Uh, if you want to drop a, a, a domain for whatever reason and cas cascade, what the standard says to do is change the type of the column to the base type of the domain, and then copy the domain's constraint over to the column. Makes sense, right? We're getting rid of the domain, but we still want everything to work the same, and so we, we copy that over. What do you think Postgres does? It drops the column. <laughs> so you just want to drop this domain that you thought might be a good idea, but it turns out you're only using it in one place, maybe, and so too much of a maintenance hassle. Whatever your reason, you want to drop it, well, you lose your data in Postgres. Uh, and because of that, my advice is always just don't use domains, which is unfortunate because I find them quite useful. Uh, that somehow needs to be fixed. I mean, dropping the column is not. <coughs> yeah. So that, that was uh, a couple examples of what I think the standard gets wrong, what I think Postgres gets wrong. Uh, and now here are some things that um, are coming from the standard into Postgres, and so hopefully we won't get them wrong because we didn't do it differently before that. The first one is enhanced integer literals, which Peter touched on in his talk previously, so if you were there, you kind of know what this is going to be. But basically now we can, we can write integers like this. So we can specify them in, in binary, octal, uh, hex, and then of course decimal. And then we can also have separators uh, to make it easier to read. This, uh, I was hoping would be in 15, but it's not, but part of it is. And that is, it, what would be the value of this today? 
in, in Postgres 14. If I said, I, I use the, the standard uh, values, but imagine this is a select. So select and that. What do you get? You get zero with an alias of B1001 or not. Because the as keyword is optional. So it sees this as, OK, I finished parsing a number, so the rest must be an alias. Um, but this number here, and I'm not up to date on my binary, is not zero. That's more than zero. So what is in, did you get that in 14, or is that only in 15? OK. What is in 15 is junk removal. So if, if you do this, you'll get an error, right? syntax error. Uh, and if you want to, to do zero alias b something, you, you should either put the as keyword, which you should have done anyway, or just put a space in between. Um, and that's in preparation of, hopefully in 16, getting uh, the, the full syntax. So uh, new standard features that are coming in post Postgres 15 is, uh, one of them is merge. That's a big one. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, because Simon's talk right after this one is all about merge. So I'm not going to, it's like the, the comedian who's ending his show. It's like, um, Next comedian's a friend of mine, so I'm just going to tell all his jokes. Um, <clears throat> so merge is basically uh, merging one table into another. Um, and we had that for 9.5, I think. And during beta, or very late in the cycle, it, it was ripped out for, um, I don't think it was a performance reason. I think it was correctness issue. But anyway, it was ripped out. And now it's back in. And many people, including myself, are very happy about it. The other one is JSON table, which takes a JSON document and a whole bunch of syntax and turns it into uh, a, a, a standard relational table with many different rules of how to deal with things, how to do things recursively, and, and join everywhere. Unfortunately, that one just got ripped out of Postgres 15. So I'm really hoping it'll be in 16, but for now it's not. It would have looked something like this, which to most people does not look like SQL, but it, it, it is. <laughs> so I, I used to go into more detail on this slide, but since we won't have it, I'll, uh, I'll update for 16 when we do have it. Um, <clears throat> uh, Peter touched on this one too. Uh, unique nulls not distinct. When uh, when you have a unique constraint, if you, if you insert one value and then you insert that same value, you get a violation of the constraint. But if you insert a null and then another null, there's no violation, not in Postgres. If you go over to MySQL, or better, if you're coming from MySQL, their nulls are, uh, do, um, provoke um, errors of, of uniqueness. And so that could be uh, pretty weird for your application if, if you've built your application on MySQL or another database like that, and you move over to, to Postgres, you're not gonna get any errors now when you insert multiple nulls, which since you weren't expecting that case because when you started this application on a different database, you would have gotten errors, you can have garbage data, kind of silently without knowing it. Um, so now in 15, if you're doing that sort of migration or if you just want that behavior, in the unique constraint, you can, you can specify what behavior you want for the nulls and it will respect that. Um, so that's, it's, one of the, it's very simple, but it's also one of my favorite features. All right, new standard features in Postgres 14, and I'm not going to go back through the whole history of, of all this, but this one was also one of my favorites, is the search and cycle clause. Um, <clears throat> have you ever written a recursive CTE? Have you ever come into a case where your data had a loop in it, and so your query just takes forever, literally, until it runs out of memory or whatever it runs out of? Yeah. Uh, and so you have, to, you have to protect against that. If you think your data has a loop in it when it shouldn't, 
you have to write some, some weird queries to, to make sure you're not getting into an infinite loop. Um, with the cycle clause, you just say cycle, when, when, whenever you see this field, or even a collection of fields, whenever you see that twice, then mark it as a, a cycle and stop, stop evaluating it. And so now we don't have, well, for this case, we don't have infinite loops in, in recursive CTEs anymore. Okay. Here are some features that I think should not be that difficult, but maybe they are. And so maybe people who would like to start in um, contributing code to Postgres might, might be able to pick one of these up. I'm not sure. But the first one should be really easy. Next value four. And we only, we, we have half of it implemented. Hmm? Not easy? OK. Well, it's not easy. <laughs> um, but I would like it. Uh, next value four is how you get the next value from a sequence. Okay. So in, in Postgres, <clears throat> you have to call a function uh, next value. In Oracle, it's, I think it's the sequence dot next value. Um, others might have others, but the standard way to do it is just say next value for uh, and the sequence name. Casting with formats. Uh, I like this addition to uh, the SQL standard. All we know how to do today is cast X as Y. So cast a value to a certain type. In the standard, you can also format that. So if you're, if you're casting a date to uh, text, well, you can just put the, the format of what you want in there. So for example, uh, you can cast today's date in American notation and just say, this is, this is the weird one. Um, or, you, or you could go the other way <clears throat> and cast um, uh, text you have into a date format. Or, uh, no, I'm sorry. Go the other way and cast an actual date into text. And you might even have another column or something in user preferences to see what, how they want it casted. And then just put that straight in the, in the, in the cast syntax. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how hard that would be. Uh, but it seems like a nice feature. Oh, um, the standard only defines this between strings and dates. But Postgres, of course, would define it for anything that made sense. Um, I mean, I, th I think that's what I would want to see um, for any kind of formatting. Uh, the corresponding is, I think, quite useful. If you have two tables and you want to union them, you have to make sure that all of the columns are of the same type and order. Right? So if you have two views that are almost the same, they have the same basic data, but then they have uh, extra columns for like weird extra stuff that you need. And you want to union them together because all you really care about is the, the main data. Today, you have to select all of the columns that you want uh, and list them all out, and there could be 50, 50 columns, and just excluding the one that you don't want. Union another 50 columns, including the one you don't want. Or perhaps um, the columns weren't exactly in the right order. With the corresponding, uh, you can just say, do it. <laughs> uh, so table A here is a shortcut, a, a SQL standard shortcut, which means select star from. So select star from A, union all corresponding, select star from B. And then by column name, it will rearrange everything and exclude the columns that are not in common and just give you that. Um, and it's a lot clearer to read when, when it's shorter to write, but also easier to read. Sometimes, though, you might not want all these columns. Uh, so it's good that, that it got reordered and extra columns got, got left off. But if you still don't want them all, uh, you can do a corresponding by and say, I want all that, but just do X, Y, Z. And no matter which order they're in, they'll, it'll be rearranged to, to do this. Uh, this seems to me like it should just be in the rewriter, uh, just to transform, make, make, the, make this syntax become the much more cumbersome syntax, and, and then have the, the optimizer go through that. 
but again, I don't know. If I did know, I would write it myself. Um, character varying, which uh, Peter kind of also talked about before. When you specify, and now it's optional, but when you specify character varying, you give it a length, a maximum length. And is that length in bytes or in characters? Well, by default it's in characters, and in Postgres it's always in characters, but you can say that you only want it in bytes, which they use the word octets. Um, so I use character varying here, but we could use byte A, for example. If we wanted byte A and then uh, N octets to, to limit uh, what that is, you can specify which one. Uh, at, at the very least, I think it would be nice to accept octets as a noise word and then raise an exception saying we don't implement that, just so we can have migration scripts coming from databases that do implement that. At least they know where they went wrong. And <clears throat> yeah. um, There are some interesting predicates that I, that I like, um, that I, I wish we had. You'll know some of them, but not as predicates, so let's find out what they are. The unique predicate. <clears throat> um, if you know the exists predicate, you say where exists and then a subquery, and then if there are any rows in that, uh, the result is true, and if there are no rows in, in the subquery, the result is false, right? The unique predicate is the same thing, except it's looking for duplicate rows. So <clears throat> you can, uh, you can say where unique and then a subquery, and if, if the subquery is basically the same as, as a select distinct of that same subquery, then it returns true. And you can use this in correlated subqueries to find out if, um, like for example, if, if you want all of, the, uh, all of the orders where everything comes from the same um, producer. Or something. You just say where unique, and then uh, ref reference th the the producer. And and if they're all the same producer, then, it, then the query comes out. And if they're not, they don't. Or or the other way around. Um, some of these, because uh, I've never seen this um, implemented anywhere, and I think this one and the next one were created in order to define other things. Like for example, this is how a unique constraint is defined. Um, a unique constraint says that after the um, after completion, the the queries select unique, and then table must be true. But we can use it in many many different um, scenarios. The match predicate is one of my favorites, uh, and I wish we had. You know this one from foreign keys. When you say um, Column A references other table match full or match partial or match uh, simple, which is the default. Um, I don't know if you've ever used that, those options on foreign keys, but they're there. And it's kind of like a, um, a glorified in thing. So where value in query, um, except of the way it deals with, um, with nulls in, on either side of it. But you can also use uh, a unique here. So I want, I want ABC to match something in my subquery. And the partial means that if, if I have nulls here, then I just want to match the things that are not null. And then unique says, but I only want one match. So it's, it's a powerful predicate. Um, and I think it would be really nice to have. So. And then now some pipe dreams, some, some features that I know are not going to be coming to Postgres anytime soon. Uh, the first one is assertions, uh, mainly because this is just difficult. An assertion is basically a check constraint, but over the entire database. Um, and so the problem is, when do you check it? Um, if, if you have multiple tables because you have a whole bunch of joins and things to, to find out, like all this has to equal that, um, how do you know when, to, when to, to revalidate this? But more importantly, more importantly, what do you do about concurrency? Uh, because if while I'm checking that there are no more than 10 rows in this table, 
some, somebody else goes and inserts an 11th row, but I don't see it in my transaction, then that slips through the assertion. So I'm not quite sure how that, how that could work in, in practice. Uh, in theory, it works great, but in practice, uh, no idea. But that would be nice. Uh, match recognize is another one of my favorites. This is basically a, um, it's, it's regular expressions, except instead of working on characters in a string, it works on rows in, in a result set. So the syntax is kind of funky, but uh, it's basically, so select something from a table, match recognize, and then you have all these uh, options. So you can partition by and order by, that's, that's fine for now. Uh, if, if you've ever done window functions, you know what that means. Um, and then I'm gonna jump down here to define. And so these are basically where clauses. So X, uh, I, I would say define X as um, the column one equals two. And then Y as column two equals 40, or whatever. And then I, I just create a whole bunch of where clauses. And then I have a pattern. And so I want, starting from the, from the beginning, which I would have an order by here for that, Starting from the beginning, I want one row that matches X, and then many or no, no rows that match Y, and then one row that matches Z. And if I, if I have that, that's a, that's a result that I want in, uh, in my query. And if I can't find that, then the select will do nothing, because it didn't find anything that matched uh, this, this pattern. And then the measures, which they, in my opinion, should have called select, this is what comes out of, um, of, of this whole thing. So it's kind of complicated. And in this kind of talk, I, don't, I, I, you know, I could do a full talk just on, on this. Um, so I, I'm gonna leave it at, at that for now, but it, I think it would be really powerful. And to my knowledge, only Oracle has it. Um, but there are, there are many, many applications for this in analytical queries. Uh, property graph queries, I'm not gonna talk much about that. Um, I don't think we have any talks on, on graph queries in this, this conference. Um, but basically, as Peter said in his talk, what's coming to, uh, to SQL in the next version is uh, basically the equivalent of the Cypher query language in uh, Neo4j. It's not exactly that, but it, it's the same, same kind of concept. Uh, polymorphic table functions. Um, these are something that we almost had a patch for, um, but it, in SQL, one of the, the hardest things is that you have to know what the structure is before you run the query. You have to know how many columns you have, what their data types are, and all that. Polymorph polymorphic table functions kind of improve on that, where these functions would be called during planning time, if I'm not mistaken, to find out uh, what we're doing. So if we wanted to just select, uh, select star from CSV file, the, the polymorphic polymorphic table function CSV file would go in, look at the CSV, say, okay, I, I, have, this many, um, I have this many columns. There's a header in this file, so I, these are their names. And then now, I was, I was gonna say Postgres, but now the SQL engine knows what the query structure looks like. Um, so that could be quite useful for, for many occasions, but we don't have it. Um, periods. Uh, I've, I've done an entire talk on, on just periods, but I I'm, I'm only have five minutes left, so I'm gonna go quickly here. Uh, a period is basically, it, it's very similar to what Postgres has in, in range types, where you've got a, uh, a start value, an end value, and the start has to be inferior to the end. Uh, I believe the SQL standard only defines this for timestamps, but there's no reason it couldn't be integers and anything else that's sortable. Um, <clears throat> so I could create a table like this where I have my ID, which is always generated always as identity. My data, it doesn't matter what. Uh, and valid from and valid to, and then I declare a period, which is the validity, which is valid from and valid to. And then with that, um, I can do, looks like I don't have, yeah, I don't, I should have more details on this, but uh, with that I, I can 
uh, I can make sure that um, the, the period does not overlap. Um, and there are certain things that you can do with, with this. Like I can say, imagine this table was, was for uh, vacation time. And so somebody goes in and says, I'm on vacation from this date to this date. And then uh, something blows up and they say, oh, you have to, I know you're on vacation, but you have to come fix this, oh, we're all in trouble. And so uh, she would want to remove that date from this table, saying I, I'm, I worked, so I wasn't on vacation. And so you could do a delete from this table for a portion of validity and f f from one date to the next date. And that delete would not delete her en entire vacation time. It would split it in two. And so a delete would actually create a row. Uh, and so you would have one row from the beginning part of the, the period and one row from the ending part of the period, and it's the middle part that had been deleted. Uh, so it, it can do some pretty powerful stuff. Uh, it's also with periods that they do system versioning. Uh, system versioning is a very much requested feature. Uh, all of the databases have it that I know of, except for PostgreSQL. So MySQL has it, MariaDB has it, Oracle, of course, has it. Um, DB2 started it, I think. Um, but we're the last ones not to have this, and I'm very upset about that. Uh, basically, what it, what it does is anytime you modify a table that you've marked as being system versioned, the old, old row will be put into a history table. And then you can do, uh, do I have that in my slides? I do not. Then you can do something or select from the table as of some date. And then it'll either get it from the table or it will go look in the history table. And so you can even um, join one table as of now, join that with the same table as of last week and see what changed. Uh, in, in simple ways. Um, or you can just summon up what, what the value was at the, at, at the time. Uh, one use case for this might also be uh, VAT rates that might change. Uh, and so if you want to uh, recreate an invoice, you can join on the VAT rate using the invoice date. And it, if the VAT rate has changed, it will go back in history and get the VAT rate that was used at the time of the invoice date. That would be a good, good example of, of that. And um, that's basically it. Um, so thank you. And if you have any questions. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? First batch. I'll talk about that if, if there are no questions. <clears throat> I guess having been around from the time when we added a lot of SQL standard stuff in the early 2000s, my reaction is, we're not pathetic. Like, we're pretty good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if I'm going through this, I'm like, okay, yeah, we don't have, like, the bird with the pink feathers on it, but um, th there was nothing that I kind of said, wow, look at this, we're missing this humongous thing, or um, we made a huge mistake about syntax and... Um, some of this stuff is surprisingly consistent, uh, as, as though, even though it's been done over a decade or two, you know, when I look at the syntax, I'm yeah. like, this stuff holds together pretty mm -hmm. well. Even the syntax we've created, I'm surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think the wow, we don't have this, I, I would put two on that, which is match recognized and system versioning. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I mostly agree with Bruce, system versioning, that has been a very painful thing for those of us who need to, you know, basically do like flashback queries. Yeah. Which we've had in the 90s. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you time travel in the docs and you read about time travel in it, then uh, yeah. <coughs> but yeah, I think, but, but it's also, we're in a different place hardware wise. You yeah. know, I think, I think that, I think that, that really enables us to just have that again. Yeah. Oh, cool talk. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Hey, uh, so what's the barrier from making this stuff happen for you? So something like... For uh, me, competence. What is it? For me, competence. I, I don't competence. know how to implement this. Yeah, but isn't there <laughs> something like, just from Peter's talk, it feels like there's an easy way to get someone to WG3, maybe not there, but a representative 
on behalf of you or something like that. Is there like, it seemed like the barrier for entry was low from Peter's talk, and now I feel like, you know, it's a lot harder. So something like well, well, most cast of, format most of should this be easy. Was features that the standard has that we don't have. Right. So like, do we want to add these things into Postgres? How do we do that? Write a patch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying you seem to have a lot more knowledge than I do. So it's slightly, and I know the talk wasn't meant to be, but it's slightly discouraging that they're not there already. And I feel like I need to now raise my level to, to get there a little bit, if that makes uh, sense. Right. I, I wasn't trying to be discouraging. I was, no, 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 I, was I, trying I to know. Show, I, I like, took it the negative way. These are some awesome yeah. features that we don't have. Let's try and get people motivated to implement them. Uh, yeah. uh, I think this was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. I Thank think you. it should be mandatory for all the Postgres programmers in my project. Um, do you know if the recording is going to be available? I. I Probably, yes. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Last question. Um, yeah, I mean, it was uh, really a, a, an answer to what that gentleman over there was saying. Okay. Um, one thing that I've observed over the course of many, many years is that as Postgres gets more and more perfect, people seem to complain more about the tiny imperfections that we have, right? So, so when there was a huge gap between Postgres and where it needed to be, everybody went, isn't it amazing? We're 50% there, you know? Uh, and now that we're kind of 99% there, everybody's going, what, what, what's wrong with you? Well, why have you not done the last percent, right? You know? um, so, you know, it, it, it is happening and, uh, you know, but I mean, the thing is, Every single patch that happens is one guy or one uh, gal, or obviously, but a, a team of people carrying it over the line. And these things are not trivial. You know, it takes years to, to get things going. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, but patches welcome, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like the, the very first thing I said, these should not be hard. I was immediately shut down by Peter, said, no, that, yeah. that's hard. So <laughs> I just <clears throat> wanted to address that because I feel like it might be discouraging to people coming here and asking a question like, why isn't this in Postgres? And as de Postgres developers, we're like really defensive about it. And I feel like <laughs> it's actually a reasonable question. We shouldn't expect people to know what the difficulty or engineering difficulty of getting a feature in or the political reasons why it doesn't get in or whatever it is. So like, I don't know. I'm not suggesting that we add a wiki page that says these are the features that you know we would like to have, and this is this links to the hackers thread about like what the engineering difficulty is. We but, have like, that page. But... It, well, for the ones that you just mentioned. Um, I think they're on there. The, we, there are two wiki pages. There's one that has a to do of of things like people can choose from if they want to get started, and another one which um, is basically this talk, which is. Uh, standard features versus Postgres features. Okay, well maybe we can, like, I think this talk is a great start in communicating that, but I just think that, like, that we need to be more supportive and, and like, I just think that that response to that question was really unfair, I guess, like, from, from us as developers. I don't know. I would feel discouraged if I was not a Postgres contributor by the answers that I just heard, so, yeah. Okay. That's all we have time for. Thank you very much. Thank you.